What? Hmm. No. Let's start. I can't do this better. I can't do this better. So I wasn't going to make another video, but, uh, I wanted to have a higher frequency so that I could get uh, more filtering or more smoother. But then I had another problem, uh, because the hardware PBM has now got to be software PBM, because uh, you, you can't make 50Hz PWM from the hardware module, the CCP module that we talked about. And because of the prescaler isn't large enough, so but on the upside though, is uh, with interrupts you can then um, <coughs> we can have a higher resolution on the signals going out on the servo. So and also remember, this servo this is an analog device. It uh, doesn't have any steps. It has infinite number of steps. So the so it's a matter of uh, the, the un digital to analog conversion. To make uh, to make the resolution high enough. So what I've done is to to uh, increase the resolution by three times. So we'll have a look at that. So I thought if I'm going to increase the resolution, then I will want to know what the resolution was in the first place. So what I did was I uh, I measured the duty cycle for the le lowermost servo position and the highest one. And then I found I was out of spec actually, I haven't looked at it at all. So no wonder that I got extreme uh, servo angles. So I started and figured out what setting I had to do to get the uh, 100 to 200 microseconds. So that was uh, 45 to 125. And the uh, center position 75 was uh, better at 85 than I have used, so then I get uh, more, uh, uh, what should I say, more range out of the servo in both directions, not only one direction. So, what is the step resolution then? Well, we had uh, one microsecond to uh, adjust from uh, 1 to 2 sorry we had 1 millisecond to 2 millisecond to adjust so I have 1 millisecond and in that man 1 millisecond I have about 80 steps so that's about 12.5 microsecond per step and why do I measure it in time because uh, the microcontrol is a uh, time device though so <laughs> So increase this resolution, the single step has to be smaller than 12 and a half. But then I wrote a program to show one step to another. And then I measure 18 micro steps. So microsecond per step. So I don't know why deviates from this. Maybe I'm, uh, uh, I'm doing something wrong in the calculation. Anyhow, it's not that far, but uh, it's, uh, well, it's maybe three halves or something from, so it's a bit out. Anyway, we uh, calculated it theoretical and we measured the uh, actual, um, so So the thing is that it, it was the oscillator was running at one megahertz, and that means at one megahertz the CPU will run at a fourth of that. So that means 250 kilohertz. It's not that fast, but uh, 
You see, the CPU has to fetch instructions and um, and then calculate them through the the various peripherals that it has, and that takes about four clock cycles or oscillator cycles. So, if I increase it to eight megahertz, then I have two megahertz cycles. So therefore I get a half microsecond per instruction cycle. And this same frequency goes into the timer. And then was also the question, if I'm going to use a uh, timer, I want to do a 60 meter one, but I, I can't, can't get that because uh, then it's already occupied by uh, the distance measurement. Okay, I could probably have uh, multiplexed it, but that causes a lot of trouble for me, so I'll, I'll go with the 8-bit one. Also, I don't need that much <laughs> resolution. Um, okay, so we have a half a microsecond per instruction. So what is a full period of the timer? Because um, one thing is this long time, this 18 milliseconds uh, dead low period, and then you have a 1 millisecond Hybrid, although those are fixed, those will always be at least this one will always be one millisecond, and this 80 millisecond might be 19 millisecond if the if the um, pulse width is uh, shortest. Anyway, so what is the largest uh, largest timer period? Because I have to know this because. Uh, then I know uh, if I can fit the whole period into the full range. So let's see. The T period is uh, it's 8 bits, therefore there's 255 steps times then 0.5 microseconds, that's another way of writing it, times the prescaler. And the prescaler is can't be lower than 1, so I thought maybe I could get faster than that, but no. So in theory, for every step, when the prescaler is 2, I get 1 microsecond per step, and that means 1000 steps in 1 millisecond. So, uh, yeah. But uh, if I do that, then uh, you see here, if you have a 8 bit timer, it's 255 steps in one period, so I don't. Then it will wrap around 4 times almost. So that's not ideal for us. So therefore we increase the prescaler from 2 to 8 and then we get 4 microseconds per step. And that's 200 steps in 1 millisecond. And 1 millisecond is the range we are needing. And that's perfect. Then uh, there's only uh, 5 or 6 steps left of the whole whole period. So <laughs> you're utilizing the whole um, we're utilizing the whole timer period here. That's great. So I'm using prescaler 8 setting on the timer. And I wrote that down. That's uh, 010 in that register or those bits in the incon register. So, or option rig. We'll look at that also. But um, what about the time here? Shall I just set it to 255 and let it repeat and then... Uh, so what I did... Uh, I wanted... I didn't want a lot of interrupts here because it slows down the program. Or we can do that if uh, the interrupt service routine is too large because then you get a lot of overhead. So what I did, I slowed down the timer by increasing the prescaler. So first I looked at 128 and then I looked at the full prescaler which is for every tick you must have 256 ticks to get sorry, for every cycle you need 256 cycles sorry, for every tick of the clock 
you need 256 cycles. That means one, um, I say period, that's not correct, it's cycle. So one cycle is 128 microseconds, and for 18 milliseconds, that's 141 ticks. That's perfect. So I set in the microcontroller the prescaler down to 256 so it, uh, the clock is uh, slowed down and then I get another tick out here so <laughs> there's no interruption going on here so the processor can run freely and then the voltage is uh, on the output it's set to high and then I set the prescaler back to 2 no oh, sorry 8 and then uh, this value here to I think 250 uh, we'll have a look at that to get sort of the fixed period here. There's a lot of pitfalls when you work with uh, interrupts. And uh, one of them is that uh, you may have too much overhead so your main program is running slower than before. So let's say your uh, so let's say your program is running here in this timeline. And now let's say we have a let's say we have a one megahertz clock and you have an interrupt every a fixed a interval at a fixed interval. So, now the problem is, let's say you have a, uh, you have to calculate something in this period. Let's say, um, let's say you have to calculate a, uh, a big function, a mathematical function, and let's say that normally without the interrupts it will take this long. Okay, so this is the time it will take to calculate this function. So maybe I should draw it here. Now, if your interrupt routine has full of code in it, the more code you have in your interrupt routine, the more time it will take. Right? So, The function that you you was calculating here is no longer calculating inside this interrupt local because the processor is busy. So you have your calculation going here, and all of this will be added up to your delay, to your latency, or what you call it, or. Your all of these times you have spent in the interrupt will then be make your function take longer. So sometimes when I want to test if I'm interrupting too much, I just do a delay one second, and then I and then I watch my uh, LEDs and I flip a LED on and off. And if uh, to me it looks like it's going slower than one second, then I know maybe I'm doing too much here. That's one thing you can do, but uh, that doesn't really help you if you have like a um, if you I, I can show you if you have seen my clock over there. Oh, sorry, my if you have seen my thermometer over there. That the thermometer this has to read data from a um, yeah yes this thermometer reads the data from a uh, one wire protocol and that the one wire protocol it requires a certain time between bits so bits are called like uh, lengths between pulses. So if you then you can't read in the correct time, 
then you will miss data. So sometimes it does miss data because <laughs> it has to update uh, the display. So and uh, that's done with the interrupts. And sometimes those interrupts they uh, make those uh, pulse readings longer than it should be. So it gets out of sync. Uh, so what I've done, um, if if that happens during a read, it will get an error. So I have like a CRC function that <laughs> just throws away any measurements that's not uh, uh, that not that doesn't check out with the CRC code. I know it's a bit crude but um, okay, so that's what I did there. That's also why I don't like uh, using interrupts so much. But uh, that's a problem. So if the time scaler is much smaller, let's say you, um, you have to send data. So if you want to send data from here to here. Or we can say here now. So let's say this is data being sent or bit banged or whatever. Then th this doesn't work because then your signal will then uh, or your processor will then take up your time here and here and here and everything will be skewed so your data will be delayed. So what's the problem with that? Okay if you are doing synchronous then it's okay, but if it's asynchronized, then it's a problem. So, and also if you're meshing time, you can also get some uh, errors in the time measurements. But anyway, uh, let me show you. So, what we are going to do? So, we are going to make with interrupts we are going to make this waveform and uh, this is one millisecond this is 20 and this is zero and after two millisecond then we are certain that this pulse is going low so but it can be high in this period and then you have the resolution where you want to post the fold down so in that period you can then let your pulse fold down so what we did here is that we so let's use the red one again so that uh, this signifies the interrupt routine so where your processor is so here we need interrupt and somewhere here so let's say here here you need an interrupt and you also need another one here because um, okay so it has gone down here but so the signal goes like this down here and then out. But you need another one here because or else your total total period will then not be correct anyway <laughs> if we let's say if it goes down here and we, you wait a fixed 18 millisecond then you will get out too early though. So if your period is this long then the complement of this period is this long. So so such that we get to me one millisecond here so that this period doesn't flop around matter of what you set here anyway and we need a inter pair so uh, did I forget something yes I did we need an interrupt here also because we, we need to start the timer right so what I did, so do not get to too many interrupts. I don't want every interrupt one millisecond. It's not that bad actually, but if you don't need it, then uh, okay, we can drop it. So here you have 18 millisecond. And I, sh I should actually write that in green because uh, in this period, there's no interrupt going on. 
and here you have uh, one minute again and here you have due to circle and here you have the um, sort of one millisecond minus due to cycle that's the it's the complement of the due to cycle such that this period is always uh, one one in millisecond in large because if you sum this together you will get one millisecond okay so let's have a look what do we need to do so in here we need to calculate we had to set the prescaler to 8 and remember when we set the prescaler to 8 then we get um, 4 microseconds per step and also 4 microseconds per step that's much better than this it's like uh, 3 times high resolution so, we set the prescaler to 8, we reset the timer to 6, and the reason for setting it to 6 is because we want uh, 250 steps. Because 250 steps times 4 microseconds is 1 millisecond. No? And we also need to set the output to high, right? Because it goes up here. And these three instructions, these are pretty fast. They also need uh, something like if, and then some flag, right? So at least there's maybe five or six instructions going on here. It's not that bad. As long as you just flip something. If you start calculating, you can then get a lot of instructions. So that's not good. And then this part of the code will then run for one millisecond right so after one millisecond we will start restart the timer and what we do here we set uh, we set the timer zero we are keeping the same scale if we want the same range so we set timer zero sorry zero two PWM. So this will be a value between 0 and 255. Or should I do it like this? Also, um, I've written in my notes here that I set the output to low, but we, you're keeping the high output. So it won't fall down before this timer goes is reached or has uh, gone all the way around so it will then go for the period of PWM and then you have another interrupt because of this and then then you set the timer Zero. And what do you set the time of zero to then? And as I said, I wanted one millisecond from here to here. And since we have used PWM milliseconds, or whatever is in that variable, then we want one millisecond minus PWM. So then you set it to minus PWM. It's not exactly correct because there are six millisecond that uh, remains or, or six steps because we want to 250 not 256 or 255 anyway it's not that big of a deal so um, so then it will then go over here nothing will happen well we wanted the signal to go low after this PWM so we have to set out to zero and then when it has come here there comes another interrupt and now we don't want the uh, timer to to bother the CPU so much so therefore uh, therefore we set the PRE scaler to 
to what have I said? Eight two fifty six. And um, timer zero. I have calculated that to one forty one. And that's about eighteen, and then very close to eighteen milliseconds because you are. This is one millisecond, this is two millisecond, then you have 18 left. And you don't do anything with the, about the output, because it's already low here, from the previous. So, then the cycle repeats, and that's it, basically. So, so, but how do you, in your interrupt, right, you have your interrupt, routine, How do you know which of these you're going to calculate? So what I've done, I have a uh, state variable that I increase. And then you think, well, that will go to t255 and then back to zero again. Well, not if you do this state. Um, and. Let me do that again. And equals x03. So what happens if this value goes from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. And the next value is, so this is state. And then if you take another increment then you get to 100 zero zero. for each increment the whole thing is then added with itself and the value 3 in hex and the uh, x03 is this value so what happens basically is that if the values are in here nothing Will happen to it. However, anything that's outside these two first bits will always be cleared. So when you go from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3, then nothing happens there. But when you go to value 4 here, then this uh, bit is cleared. So then you're back to 0. So by doing this, you're basically creating a state value that runs between 0 and 3 and then loops so that's how I get this phase going so this state value is then increased for every every little sort of interrupts so then I just say if the state is 0 blah 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 else if state equals 1 and something you also can do as uh, since this is a change cha chained if statements with lots of else ifs if your code is very sensitive to time um, and you, you really need your interrupt to be small then uh, or your interrupt service routine to be small then then you, you should put your most sensitive or your yeah your sensitive code in here if, but I didn't do that uh, but I sh should actually put like the states uh, over here 0 1 and 2 and this long one after 3 it can be the last one though so it doesn't matter if it's uh, takes longer time in there so yeah that's just some tips so um, yeah so let's have a look at the cold end. Let's make a new project. And this will be like a... Um, I'll just call it for YouTube. YouTube interrupts.
You want me to add files? That's okay. You can create all libraries. That's also okay. Open blah blah blah. So basically, this is what you start with void main. And uh, the thing now is that we want an interrupt. So we need an interrupt service routine. So here's that. I mean, uh, we need to write void also. That's uh, C language. I think you can uh, view project manager here. And there is your source. So this is not our source anymore. So um, yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, oh no, I have two projects open at once. No. Okay, then we then we have to add this back then. Oh no. What have I done? So there you go. There you go. So now it should be okay. So if I uh, compile it now. Yeah. Now it's fine. But uh, this is not the project. This is the project. <coughs> so now we are. Good. I have never used it project manager before, so <laughs> that's why I'm so uh, I'm doing some silly things. So I have a data sheet and for this device, and this is a little bit different for every device. So you just go down and you find the oscillator. We are using the internal oscillator. Uh, but we need to check that we're actually using that. So, as you can see on the right side here, you have the system clock. So you can either use a uh, oscillator here directly, or you can use the internal one through a. Or is it called postgator? I don't know the difference there actually. What you do is you go into project and you do edit project and. This is, if you whatever is set here, it doesn't matter because uh, oh, it doesn't matter for what frequency you're getting, but it does matter for library functions like delay, for example. If you say delay one second, well, it's not going to be one second if this value here is not the same as the actual frequency, though. So. Yes, we see that this is the wrong setting. We need the RC. No, the internal oscillator. Osc IO. That means uh, I get the IO function on R A4. So I get that free. So now we have selected the internal oscillator. And if we look at the datasheet, we can also use the internal oscillator 8 MHz. Then we have to set the ERCF bits here in the OSCOM register. So let's get down to that. Here is the OSCOM register. And here you can see those three bits on top here. The, it, in the microcontrols, when you set bits like this, it's uh, you have to be nice because you don't know if there's something else in your program that it's setting the other bits. So by using this OR operator or AND operator, you can set and clear bits uh, however you want. So what I usually do is that um, I clear them first. So I clear them like this. So everything that's one will not be changed if you use AND operator. So AND1 is always whatever was before. Because if you do AND0 and something, then it always be 0. So this is a way of clearing. So I have cleared all the... Uh, what was it called again? It was called IRCF2 bits. And then I set them all again. So what was the point in that if I could <laughs> only set them 
But now, uh, for uh, demonstration sake, I want to set it to 100. Zero zero. So let's do that then. So now, this is setting 1 megahertz actually. So, and yes, we could have just written uh, like this, as I said, like this. But then you're actually clearing all of these bits here, and you don't know if they actually are set somewhere else. If you're modularizing your code, then you must take care and not set bits where someone else's modules are setting bits. So therefore it's important to just select those bits you want to set. Another way of doing this is to call the bits themselves, like for example um, RC, IRCF2, and then all the others like this and then you can set the individual bits like, like this though so and we want this set thing um so there there are many more ways of doing this and you can also do, uh, in this uh, compiler you can do they have defined for this microcontroller they have defined bits individually also so there are many ways of doing this, so, uh, but I like this one best because then you are operating on the whole register with a whole byte and and, uh, and uh, when you do that you can see in the listing here, now the listing here is short because our program is short, and you can see the b uh, byte 143 is then moved into W and then W is ended with OSCON or the file. For this part, but the compiler has uh, understood that uh, I'm only setting one bit, so therefore he, he, it uses the set bit operator. So I can show you that also. If I'm setting two bits, I don't think he does that anymore. Okay, there you can see. Now he, he moves into W first, and then then um, then he ORs it in with the OR operator. So OR bitwise OR, as it's called. Let's make the infinite while loop here, and in that while loop we want a delay for 500 milliseconds, and then we want. Can, we can use uh, port D. The first bit we want to flip that on and off. So uh, basically, we just invert it, and then we'll have to say bit though because it's defined as bit. And that didn't work, so let's compile it. RD in and declare. Okay, there's a. <laughs> Uh, right, so this microcontroller here that doesn't have that, that pin because we didn't select the correct microcontroller. So now I'm sorry about that. So now everything is wrong again. So let's just let's try, try it again out. and then it recognizes it. So this uh, microcontroller has that one. Mm. Fine, and now after those. 500 microseconds, we want it to, to switch off again. So, so first this is flips, wait a half second, flips, wait a half second, flips, and so on forever. Okay, I realized that I uh, haven't set up the port yet. So whenever you're using a port, you have to set it up. So what you have to do then is say that it's port C the three states register of port D actually has to be everything that uh, has a one on it is an input so so like this yeah so let's compile it again see if it works okay so it seems to be working and as you can see, it's blinking very much slower than one second.
and remember I set the frequency to 1 megahertz here in the code as I told you in the beginning and now I forgot it myself <laughs> but this oscillator frequency for the libraries so, and the, they don't know what the frequency is but the libraries at compile time they must know what frequency it is so therefore uh, it thinks that it has to make a much larger delay because it thinks that the frequency is so high but it isn't so now now let me see it's blinking about uh, one second per yeah now as you can see that is running let's activate the timer so the timer has an option register I'm not sure what to use first so if you're in doubt doubt go to your data sheet find the module that you are having problems with and then <coughs> let's figure out so here you have timer zero and here you can read that it's an AP timer you can see that here in the diagram so here's the FOSC divided by 4 that means it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, 8 MHz divided by 4 that's 2 MHz and if T nu CS is 0 that's a bit a register bit then you see this uh, multiplexer will select this input and then here you now have um, have 2 megahertz so you can decide whether, whether you want it this way or this way so down here if PSA is 0 so you get your 2 megahertz in here and that 2, sig two megahertz signal is then either divided by 2 or up to 256 here's the option reg so basically all of this is zero and we're not using VDT so we, this is also zero so zero 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 and then we come down to the prescaler so first of all let's set that prescaler to 256 that means we need to add uh, seven here so let's do that option reg equals in its hex seven Actually, could have just set seven. Doesn't matter. So let's see what happens then. So you can see here you have more registers. You have um, timer zero interrupt enable, and then you have timer zero interrupt flag. That flag is set every time this, the counter goes to zero or to two fifty five over to zero and wraps around. And then you also have a global interrupt, and that's uh, you can turn off all interrupts that's available on the device because you can have interrupts on buttons also. If you press a button, you can have an interrupt. And if you turn off the global interrupt enable, then uh, let's say you need to calculate something very important that you won't don't want to be interrupted, you can turn off that uh, global interrupt stuff. Off. Interrupt control register. Let's call it out. Timer interrupt T zero IE is high. We want that interrupt to happen. And we also want that flight to be cleared. Right? But remember, this clearing this also has to be done up here. And what I'm doing now is not strictly uh, uh, necessary because um, this is the only interrupt we get. But for every interrupt, you ha actually have to check what did interrupt. So you check all the flags. We don't actually need it right now. So you just do this. And then when you have set up those. Uh, stuff you also have to enable global interrupts so now let's do something useful then um, let's say the bit next to the one that is blinking in one hertz or one pulse per second 
let's make that an output so pin 1 and 0 are now both outputs and uh, down here you can see that output 0 is then flipped and if you bring that up here oops, sorry we can flip the other output like this so let's see how that looks you can see the second one is blinking faster than the first and it seems that it doesn't care at all uh, about the other one it just um, it's uh, totally independent of the first one so there you have a uh, multitasking actually oh so, yeah so let's get back to the other project we are working on let's give us save everything here there now we are back to servo test here's the interrupt routine and I uh, talked a little bit about that uh, earlier um, you can see that I have a PVM state variable it's a global variable it's up here and there's also a PWM variable it's uh, short that means it's 8 bits and unsigned them it's the values go from 0 to 255 and PVM is actually the pulse width so you could have called that duty cycle though anyway but the state is a variable that because of this part here is incremented for every interrupt and when it gets to 4 it is then back to 0 because of this so basically what you have you have a variable that is oscillating with you it is incrementing between 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3 and so on so when it is 0 then we want a 18 millisecond output low so let me show you that now let me show you that actually I have to compile it because now I <laughs> Reprogram the the ship over here, so I'm not getting a signal. But now that it's programming, it should pop up. So there you go. Perfect. And let's see if we take five minutes again per division. So here, the five, ten, fifteen, twenty. So that's almost. 20 milliseconds wide. Okay, get back to code. And then you have here PM status 1 in the next in the time it wraps around. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about uh, that. To get the 80 millisecond output low, I am setting the option register to uh, 0000111. 000 000 and therefore, if you look here, what happens then? you get the highest uh, division or the, the slowest prescaler rate and when I get that I know that if I set it to minus 141 then I know I will get 18 milliseconds that's what we have calculated in the beginning of the video so when then that signal comes back again over here then you want the output to go high we are changing the prescaler here again but we are setting up at high also so so what is zero one zero that's one eighth and that's also one that gave me the almost perfect the one millisecond per uh, so, um, a revolution of the clock and we also set the time to six and that was also to get two fifty um, steps because that was closer to to one millisecond and then it wraps around again and now after that millisecond so let me just increase the resolution here so this is millisecond, one millisecond 1.2, 1 1.4, 1 1.6 so it's about one and a half 
So when this uh, wave comes up to one millisecond here, then change its state again to here, and what you can see is that uh, the timer zero now is set to whatever is in the PWM variable. So this is where our variable comes in and changes how long the timer will roll between zero and one millisecond. You can't get zero exactly, but yeah, you get pretty close. And um, when it has done that, that means that the output goes low. Then it also waits another minus PWM. And the reason for that is that you want uh, to have eight millisecond, 18 milliseconds from this point and not this point, because this point is variable. Right, so you want to start your uh, your pulse again on a fixed rate, like this, or it will just jump around. So when you switch to PWM, or you vary the PWM, so yeah. <laughs> so let's roll the ball, see what happens. Nothing happens. Okay, so let's. Um, increase the proportional value so we get some movement on the ball and now we can already see this, that it's, it's changing so let's increase the resolution to one minute again so it's um, it's uh, varying in between here so and if I now increase the proportional value is to see a larger swing and the ball is pounding on the edges so <laughs> even more even more and then I think if I got too long it will I have a mistake in the code it will wrap around <laughs> check it out it's almost all the way out now. Oh, there is that. Oops, oops. <laughs> so that doesn't work properly at all. But that's okay. And since we are uh, oscillating, let's uh, put in some derivative to break down the ball. That didn't work at all. Okay, the game is too high, so let's get it down. So there you go. see the ball but uh, maybe you can hear it it's slowing down now so let's get up to 10 derivative yeah so it starts to oscillate again now 